Financial analysis is something that every FP&A professional needs to master. Because without it, you can't provide the type of insights leaders need for making critical decisions. I've led FP&A teams at some of the biggest companies in the world, like Squarespace, Procter & Gamble, and Unilever. And now I'm the director of the FP&A program at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and a corporate trainer. Today, I'm going to break down the fundamental building blocks of financial analysis that every FP&A FP&A professional needs to know from how to organize data to the five categories of financial ratios you should be tracking. By the end of this video, you'll have a clear roadmap for conducting better financial analysis and improving decision quality at your company. Let's get into it. So let's start with the foundation, how companies actually organize their financial data. The first thing you need to understand is the account hierarchy. This is your lowest level of data organization and every expense or revenue item gets its own unique account number. For example, your direct marketing expense would have its own specific account number. While account numbers aren't strictly mandatory, they're highly recommended for creating connected databases because regular names are too prone to small typos that break the connections. Now, the next level up is cost centers versus profit centers. Cost centers are departments that don't directly generate revenue, think finance, HR, operations. Profit centers are departments that do generate revenue, like your sales team. The whole point here is to track which expenses are directly related to revenue generation and which aren't. But almost everything else is optional. Companies can choose to organize their data by department hierarchy, business units if they're diversified, legal entities, which becomes important with M&A, geographic locations, product and service lines, customer segments, different channels like online versus retail versus wholesale, or even project tracking if you're in construction, software development, or engineering. The key thing to remember is that these are strategic choices that are tied to how decisions are being made. When a company decides to track my business unit, for example, they're usually also restructuring to put someone in charge of that business unit. The data structure then allows the company to evaluate how well that executive is doing their job. Now, there are two critical concepts you must understand. First is your chart of accounts. This is basically a database that contains all of your organizational dimensions, everything I just mentioned. It should document your account hierarchy, cost centers, departments, all of it. And here's a pro tip. Whenever you want to do a financial analysis in a part of the company you aren't familiar with yet, your first step should be reviewing your chart of accounts. It'll show you what analysis is already possible with existing data versus what you'd need to implement first. The second critical concept is unique identifiers. These are names or numbers that clearly identify whatever you're analyzing. They're essential for connecting data from different systems like your ERP system and your CRM. With these, you can track a customer's entire journey from being a lead to making a purchase. But without these, you're going to have data consistency issues all over the place. By the way, if you want free access to my top frameworks and strategies for FP&A, click the first link below to get my 10 most popular one pagers. Back to the video. All right, so now that you understand how data is organized, let's talk about making sure your data is actually clean. Because dirty data will mess up every analysis you try to do. There are six characteristics that clean data needs to have. First, it needs to be accurate, free from errors. This is especially important for anything that gets entered manually, like headcount data or prospect information in your CV. Second, it needs to be consistent. Same tracking methods across different data sets and over time. You can't compare how a metric changed over years if you've been tracking it differently each year. Third, completeness. All the necessary data points need to be present and available. This sounds obvious, but it's trickier than you think because in FB&A, we usually work with aggregate data. We're looking at the sum of all transactions for an account, not individual transactions. So you might not notice if something is missing. Fourth, your data needs to be uniform. Consistent formats for things like dates and currencies. Fifth, needs to be relevant. Only include data that actually influence the decision you're analyzing. And sixth, it needs to be up to date and reflect current 
information. Now, what do you do when your data isn't clean? If you work at a large company, go to your IT business partner and ask them to walk you through their data governance processes. If you're the small company without an IT department, you need to trace issues back to the original source and fix them at the root. Don't just patch things in Excel. That's not sustainable. But there's an even bigger issue you have to be aware of. I had to learn this the hard way. A few years ago, I led an FP&A team at a tech company. One of my team's priorities was to improve forecast accuracy by analyzing the marketing funnel. In our case, the funnel looked like this. People who might buy or product arrive on a company website. Then they sign up for a free trial that gives them access to all features for two weeks. And then hopefully they decide that they like the product and make a purchase. We analyzed the funnel because changes in conversion rates at each step could point to risks or opportunities that may impact the forecast going forward. For example, if fewer people convert from website visitor to a free trial, then maybe our copy isn't good enough or we are attracting the wrong people. Or if suddenly more people convert from a free trial to a paid customer, then perhaps a new product feature is very appealing. So one day I'm sitting at a large meeting room with most of the senior leaders present. I was presenting the results of our funnel analysis. It was a big moment for me because my team and I had worked on this analysis for a long time and I didn't frequently get the opportunity to present in front of the entire leadership team. The head of marketing was there, the head of product and engineering, and my manager, the VP of finance, was there as well. I was making a point that the conversion rate of website visitors to free trials has dropped in recent months. The head of product interrupts me. He says, your numbers for website visitors aren't right. I'm seeing different numbers. In fact, looking at our analysis, since there actually are much fewer website visitors, conversion rates improved recently. For a moment, I was shocked and didn't know what to respond. We double checked and triple checked our numbers before the big presentation. I checked them myself again right before the meeting. There's no way we accidentally used the wrong figures. The rest of the meeting was messy because no one knew what the right numbers were. We had to stop the conversation there and the group moved on to the next topic. Of course, once the meeting was over, I immediately dove into the data to figure out what had happened. I asked the head of product to share his data with me and poured over it for a long time until I finally figured it out. It's not that the data itself was off. It's that we had different definitions of what a website visitor even means. See, when you look at website analytics, most people only stay for two to three seconds on a new website they haven't visited before. Should those be counted as a valid visit? Was it enough time for them to decide if a trial was worth it? Or should we count them anyway? Because since we might have paid for them coming there with advertising dollars, it turned out that the product team had a more strict definition of which visits counted as a website visit in the context of our final analysis. After several rounds of discussions, we landed on a definition everyone agreed to and we could pick up the final analysis again, but a lot of time was lost in the process. How could this have been prevented in the first place? By having a single source of truth of data and metric definitions. A single repository where everyone in the company gets the data and calculated metrics from, with someone whose job it is to keep this repository up to date and complete. Now let's talk about the five categories of financial ratios out there. Understanding these will help you make sure you're not missing any important metrics. First, liquidity ratios. These evaluate your ability to meet short-term financial obligations, things like paying your debts and salaries. A common example is the current ratio, current assets divided by current liabilities. This basically looks at assets and liabilities that can be turned into cash relatively quickly. Second, leverage ratios. These evaluate your debt levels and ability to meet long-term obligations. The debt ratio is a good example. Total debt divided by total assets. This shows you what portion of your company's assets are financed by debt. Third, efficiency ratios. These determine how well you're using your assets and resources. If 
you have physical products, inventory turnover is huge. That's cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. It shows you how frequently your inventory gets sold. And if it starts slowing down, you might have too much inventory sitting in warehouses. Fourth, profitability ratios. These you're probably already familiar with. Net profit margin, gross profit margin, operating margin. They show your ability to generate profits relative to revenue. And fifth, market value ratios. This gives you the external perspective that matters for investor relations. Dividend yield is an example. Dividends per share divided by stock price. This shows how investors perceive your financial attractiveness. Behind each of these five categories, there are 10 to 15 specific metrics you might want to track, but these categories give you a starting point to make sure you're being comprehensive. So you've got all these potential metrics, but you obviously can't throw them all at your leaders every time. You need to identify the metrics that actually matter. Here's how you do it. Start with the strategy and work backwards. The strategy is what the leadership team decided a company should be going after. Your job as a finance professional is to tell leaders whether that strategy is working or not. If you're saying the strategy is working, leaders can rest easy knowing they'll probably hit their targets. But if your metrics say the strategy isn't working, then they need to get up and do something about it. I teach a six step process for this. Step one, understand the strategy and company objectives. Step two, define what success looks like and how you'll measure it. Sometimes this is easy, like if the strategy is to increase sales team effectiveness, you can measure revenue per sales rep. But sometimes it's harder. Like like if the strategy is to do more long-term brand building, that's hard to measure. Step three, identify the drivers. What needs to be true to achieve these objectives? Step four, brainstorm your ideal metrics. But don't worry about data availability just yet. You want to separate the brainstorming phase from the feasibility phase so you don't eliminate good metrics too early. Step five, evaluate data availability and implementation feasibility. Step six, align on the final metrics you're moving forward with. The key is to focus on metrics that help leaders make better decisions. Don't track everything. Focus on what matters for strategy execution. Finally, let's talk about variance analysis. This means explaining why business performance differs from expectations. For that, you need to focus on three components, what, why, and so what. The what is identifying and quantifying the variance. The why is determining the reasons behind it. And the so what is interpreting the significance and making making recommendations. Here's a real example. The what? Professional fees are unfavorable by 251,000. The why? This is primarily driven by an auditor fee increase of 267,000. Now, many finance teams stop here. They think the job is done, but if you stop here, you're leaving a lot of value on the table. The so what is where the real value is. In this case, you dig deeper and find out the cost increase isn't due to more billable hours or a more complex audit. It's due to a significant price increase. So the recommendation is to compare the new price to other audit firms and consider changing auditors. Now, you're actually helping leaders make better decisions because you're answering the question, do we need to do something about this or is everything okay? That's what leaders want to know. The key here is to focus on the 80-20 rule. Find the 20% of line items that explain 80% of the variance. Then don't stop digging into the numbers and interviewing your cross-functional business partners until you have found the root causes for the variances that move the needle. So that's your complete beginner's guide to financial analysis. And if you want to improve further and learn all the strategies and frameworks that top FPNA teams are using, just click the first link in the description to get free access to my 10 most popular one-pager infographics. These contain the same frameworks I used when leading FPNA teams across some of the biggest companies out there and what I teach at the Wharton School. So get them now for free using the link below. If you want to learn how you can become a true financial business partner in your company, then click here.